as we continue our series, Amazing Grace, and talking about the grace of God as we've been looking at this. This is really our word uh, for all year is that we would be operating in this amazing grace this year. That it's not our strength, our might, but it is by the might of the Lord and what he has done in our lives. Amen, church. And so grace is an important part. I want to I want to just say a couple things before we get into God's word this morning, before we share it and read it this morning. Um, I, I'm so excited because our youth, um, our youth, we had 19 youth students last Sunday and uh, all in this, you know, 100 square foot space. So they were sitting on the floor. They were huddled up and I'm really excited because we actually um, just negotiated with our building to do a month-to-month rent on a suite just right down on the other side of this iWorks and so it's going to allow all our students on on Sunday morning to have more space we'll also do growth track over there baptism class if you're a night team member there will be a volunteer um, room for you to to put up your purses and and to grab you know maybe a breakfast talk or something like that as you serve. And, and this is all to, to really just begin to position ourselves um, as a church as we're growing and we're expanding and we're looking at how do we, how do we get more seats and what do we do. We had a record attendance last Sunday of 293 people. That's awesome. So thank you so much for inviting your friends, inviting your family, inviting your coworkers and your neighbors and, and, and just being intentional with the gospel. And so, so we're excited because um, for a month from now, we'll be going to three services. And so we're excited about that. Just the whole idea of creating more space for, for, for people to come. And, and, and if you know anything about church metrics, and this may be too much for you if you're guest this morning. I apologize just for vomiting some, some, of our, um, um, some of our logistics to you, but thank you for enduring this. If, if you've grown around the church and you look at churches, um, how many of you go to a movie theater and you, you, you like to sit next to the stranger next to you? Now, how many of you like that? No one. No one in here likes that, right? No one likes it, and I'm just going to tell you, no one likes it at church either. Like, can you scoot over? I put my purse there for a reason. Please don't sit by me. Yes, I want to get to know you. Yes, I may end up discipling you. You may disciple me. We may go to life group together, but don't sit next to me, right? Because I forgot deodorant this morning, and I forgot different things like that. Everybody loves a chair in between them, so that that creates that this space gets full pretty quickly. And as you noticed, uh, um, every time our space gets full, uh, the, the next Sunday, somebody who was new to our space, so maybe I'm speaking to you this morning, was new to our space, says, Man, I didn't like that person sitting next to me. It was like a little too close for comfort, you know. They were doing the thigh thing where their thigh was right next to my thigh, and they were rubbing, and, and I was just like putting a piece of connect card right in between us, you know. It's just the truth. So we're going to create some more space, and we're just believing, God, that this is, this is um, our home today and that God will create another building and space for us later. But until then, until we reach that place, we're going to create more services and more opportunities, and, and, and we'll, we'll pray that no one wants to lease that month-to-month over there so that we keep pay, paying month-to-month for that space and that we can continue to grow, that God, as God adds to our number, that we get to rejoice together we get to celebrate together and I just I, I want to commend you I want to commend you you're going to be hearing a lot about this but I want to commend you for 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 taking a risk on coming to a shopping center on the second floor next to two clubs when the elevator smells like puke the stairs you see the puke and it's just there's a lot of obstacles that keep you from this space and there's a lot of things and then I also want to commend you and say I'm so proud of you that you've invested in somebody you didn't know in this space that you actually took the opportunity to get to know somebody who was maybe sitting by themselves that Sunday or a new family that seemed a little lost and you just engaged them intentionally and in knowing that the kingdom is coming out of you every time people People come into this space. The kingdom of God, the encouragement of God would come. I mean, I'm just so thankful and I have to applaud you for that. So 
grasp. So our 930 service gets a little teaser of where we're headed, and, and you're so welcome. I hope that that brings you in the loop, but but we're pray for us as we think about strategies and we think about how to reach more people in this city, in the space that God has given us. So let's pray for that before we get into God's word. Father, we just are so thankful, so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you've brought many people to this space, God, that Lord Jesus, in a city of one and a half million people, God, that, that they're in the statistically, God, two thirds of those people do not attend church somewhere. Statistically, on the last census, Jesus, there was there was uh, of about 35 to 40 percent who were agnostic or indifferent when it came to a religion. Lord Jesus, we're praying, God, that the gospel would come forth in this city, that you would draw all men to yourself. God, I pray that we would create spaces and, and God, that it would be safe, um, uh, safe places to learn about the kingdom, to learn about Jesus and how Jesus has created people in his image and his likeness for great works and a great purpose. And that there's hope, God, and, and the people that come in discouraged, would they leave this place every Sunday encouraged and filled up, knowing, knowing that they matter in your eyes. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to be Second Corinthians 9. I, I get loud when I pray. I get loud when I'm passionate. Um, but man, wasn't it so good last week? Pastor Morgan sharing God's word with us last week. Wasn't that a great, just that, that discipline would be a delight, that discipline would be a delight and, and there's grace for that. We, that's something we're asking for, praying for, believing for. Uh, in 2009, my wife and I decided to go on a mission trip and, uh, we, we, um, committed our life that every year we would go on some sort of short term mission trip because we value short-term missions. We think it's a good idea that, that God can do more in that week in you than he could the, the every Sunday through the year. There there's, can be more done in a week than the every Sunday in the year. So, so it's something that we committed to, and, and it was 2009. We had already gone to a couple of mission trips the years before, and this time we got decided to um, pray about it, to go to South Africa, to Cape Town. And um, I was so excited about this trip. I was excited to, to go to a, another country. I always wanted to go to Africa. I always wanted to visit this continent and just um, see what God was doing, be a part of it. And 17 of us ended up raising a lot of dollars to go on a short-term mission trip. Now, when you're married with your spouse and you're trying to raise the funds in order to send you on a mission trip, everything's double, you know, double plane ticket, double mouths to feed. Everything costs double, so you're raising twice as much, but you're limited in your network of people you can contact. How many of you know that's true? So, so you know the same people. So limited network, raising twice as much. So through a lot of support letters, a lot of phone calls, a lot of meeting. Hey, just would you partner with us to go on this mission trip? Would you partner with us to go um, change South Africa? Because anytime Ben Chapman steps into a place, he thinks he's going to ch change the whole country. It's just unbelievable. And so, so would you just partner with us to do that? And and so we raise all this money and we go and and it's just an incredible time. We're 12 days on mission in South Africa in Cape Town. It's in the middle of summer here, winter there. And if you go to Cape Town, it's it's beautiful. Everything about it is a beautiful. There's there's the trees that look like Colorado um, just 10 minutes this way, and then there's the beach that looks like any Caribbean, uh, 10, 10 minutes this way, and so there's the best of both worlds in, in this one place, and it's so amazing, so epic and breathtaking, and, and I remember in this mission trip that we went to this place called Cape Point. So it's where the Atlantic and Indian Ocean meet right there at this cape. And it's majestic in every way. And you take this trail down. And as you walk down, there's this beach uh, right there at Cape Point, And the waves are just crashing. Um, uh, it just, it sounds amazing. How many of you ever heard just huge waves just crash? It feels, it feels ferocious. 
and yet majestic. And, and it was amazing. And I think about amazing grace. And I think about the overwhelming grace in our lives. And it really is this, this ferocious, magnificent power in our life that, that it comes to our life in amazing ways. Grace to a person who doesn't deserve it at all. Grace to be loved when I was unlovable. Grace to have hope when I was hopeless. Grace to cover everything that offended God from birth to death. Grace to bring me into his kingdom. It's majestic and it's wonderful. And I'm so amazed by it. I, 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 when we reach these places in, in life and we begin to see the majesty of God, and we begin to see things around us. Maybe it's a sunset. Maybe it's waves crashing. Maybe it's a destination. Maybe it's the sky or the stars. That majesty should overwhelm us. And when it does, grace is likened to that. An overwhelming feeling of, man, you didn't deserve it, but he loves you. You didn't deserve it, but it's yours. So in 2009, when we were set on this mission trip, we went and we experienced this amazing thing. And then we experienced some other things. I got to um, dive with the great white sharks off of Seal Island. That was pretty awesome. Uh, we, we, got to, we got to go on adventures. We went to the beach. We learned how to play cricket. We, we learned all of these things, and, and it was amazing. And, and when I reflected back on I was like, what was the point of that mission trip? That's what I thought. I, I didn't save a whole nation, you know. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even save a city. I don't even know if one person got saved on this mission trip, honestly. We went around and we did some social justice things, but I just, I was like, what is going on here? What is really happening in this mission trip? Have you ever gone through life wondering if you're really making a kingdom impact? Wondering if you're really making a difference? Wondering if lives were really being changed? In this moment in 2 Corinthians 8, we see Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he's encouraging them in their giving and their generosity. He's encouraging them to give to um, the poor and the needy in Jerusalem. He's going to this, this wealthy trade city who, who people are coming to know Jesus. And he's encouraging them to give to the poor who are in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. This is what we read right here. And Paul made many trips to Corinth in a five-year span to help establish this church. In AD 50, 52, Paul, Paul establishes the church in Corinth. We read about that in Acts 18. And then in AD 53, somewhere between 53 and 56, he goes and he establishes the church in Ephesus. Paul is very busy establishing and planting churches. Then we read AD 54 that, that Paul hears about the immorality in the church in Corinth because when you have a lot of means, there's a lot of temptation for immorality. How many of you know that's true? There's, well, when you have a surplus of money that you can, you can self-gratify, there's a lot of pleasure, there's a lot of things to be done and be had. This culture was a very, um, a very a, a, a culture that loved to gratify pleasure, loved to gratify the senses, and, and they had the means to do it. So Paul here Hears about some of this that's happening in the church, so he writes his first letter, challenging the church in in Corinth, and and then he begins to write this letter, talking to them about it. But we have no account of this first letter other than it was mentioned in his second letter that he wrote to them. But that letter has yet to be found um, in our historical archaeological digs. Then we we read about that Paul sends um, sends. To Corinth, um, Timothy, a second letter that he begins to write, and you know, because he continues to hear about some things, and and so he sends this First Corinthians chapter, uh, First Corinthian letter to Corinth to encourage them 
get them set straight. Hey, don't act like that. Hey, don't, hey, y'all two are sitting on the front row of church. Don't sue each other, you know, like y'all can just work it out. Pray for each other. Hey, hey, you two back there. Hey, hey, y'all can just wait to have sex until after you're married. Just control your passion, control your pleasure just a little bit. It's going to be okay. Hey, you, I, you keep coming in drunk every Sunday. Can you just quit coming drunk on a Sunday morning? Can you quit um, giving yourself to that much wine, you know? Um, enjoy, you know, a fine glass, but but don't don't start drinking, you know, at 7 a.m., start stumbling in here, right? He starts encouraging the church, like, hey, let's just act like Christians. Let's act godly. We've talked about this. There's a grace for us to act godly, right? God gives us an ability to act godly, to begin to conduct ourselves in that way. And and then we read about in, in, in the Paul's final letter, and this is after Paul has established Ephesus, and he's beginning to set his eyes on the West. He's beginning to set his eyes on, on doing future church plants in, in, in Spain and, and other parts of the world. And he sends his final letter of encouragement, and, and he sends Titus to them as well, this, this pastor. And, and, and then we read in 2 Corinthians 8, he doesn't just send Titus. He, he sends the best preacher in the land to come to them the best preacher of the gospel uh, maybe like Stephen Furtick or, or or you know somebody like that um, that he sends to the church to just go pump them up and encourage them and keep them going in the right direction how many know we just need a preacher sometimes to tell us the truth we just need a preacher in our corner to just preach a good message so that I can live great this week and do what God's called me to do and so so this is what Paul's doing I'm going to send you Titus I'm going to send this great preacher I'm I'm going to begin to do these things. And, and then he writes in his letter, in this second letter, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He talks about these contributions that he's taking up for the work of the ministry and to take care of the poor and needy in Jerusalem. And there's several reasons why Jerusalem was poor. You know, sometimes we, we think maybe a region or people are just poor because they don't work hard. I mean, you ever think that? They just don't work hard. They're just not, they're not uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. But, but there was lots of reasons. I want to list some of these reasons because they're helpful for us. So after the conversion of Christianity, many Jews would have been ostracized socially and economically, those Jews who convert to Christianity. Right in Jerusalem, it's a it's this Jewish city. So if you came to faith, all of a sudden you'd be ostracized because you came to faith. All of a sudden, they went to a different carpenter. They they went to somewhere else to buy oil. They 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 your economy started to suffer because you started following Christ. And in America, we can all, I can't fathom that really. Like, we, if we put a fish on our bumper sticker, we're going to get more business, praise God. You know, like, like we're going to get more people to sign up for us and what we're selling. The second thing is the community um, sharing described in Acts 2, 44 and 432. Um, undoubtedly, um, this would have aggravated their poverty. So in Jerusalem, with this persecution, and because there was so much oppression that, that they were, their means started dropping. And how many of you know when your means start dropping, sometimes you have to start sharing? How many of you know that's true? If, in, in our silos in San Antonio, right, in, in our businesses, in our checks um, sometimes we're just fine we're pretty self-sufficient we're pretty great but 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 if our means were to hit or our means were to drop you start sharing this came about um, a lot in 08 when when the recession happened think about this when the recession happened all of a sudden um, kids were moving back in with their parents because they couldn't afford rent or find a job um, all of a sudden we saw many people getting their master's and doctorate degrees all of a sudden because there were no jobs on the market and they were living at home home and and the Christians in 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 the United States even more so opening your home opening different things I remember Brandy decided she was going to move away from coaching softball she coached at Odessa College for five years and God told her I want you to stop that and I want you to move where I'm going to tell you she didn't know what that was yet so she she wrestled with it right because because Brandy grew up with not a lot and so to have a job like this and and to 
coach something that she loved. She didn't really understand. So she wrestled with God for about six months. Are you sure that's God? Are you sure, God? Am I hearing you right? How many of you ever question if you hear God right? You know, all of us, right? Like, are you sure? And divinely, it was like, baby, you just have to be obedient. So she stepped out in obedience. And when she did, this was 2008, right before the recession, and then the recession hits, and there are no jobs. But I'm thankful for a businessman who worked at a security bank who was going to our church, who was a Christian. And he, he talked to Brandy, and he would oftentimes check and see how she's going. And he created some space for her and hired her on to help take care of her needs. Isn't that amazing? It's just like the, the, it was so kingdom seeing that I'm going to just provide for your needs. I'm going to share a little bit and create some space for you so that you can have a job. How many of you know that uh, that's kingdom? This is what God's talking about, that we start giving to one another and we start doing this. And, and the third reason that the Jewish people were out is there was a famine in the land. There was a food shortage in Palestine at that time under the emperor in AD 46. So not only was all this oppression happened, but now there's this famine. There's a food shortage in the city. Um, so, so now there's even more need taking place. And then we see maybe another reason that Paul cared so much about Jerusalem. If three weren't enough, he realized this is where Christianity started. And if I were to just let it go and die out, I feel like I would kill some of, uh, some of what, where God started the movement of what he started doing in this city. That there's some importance for these Jews who have come to faith. There's importance in the fulfillment of the Messiah coming um, to, to Israel and choosing a people and fulfilling that promise. There was this importance to that. So maybe that's another reason. And, and then lastly, I'm sure Paul was thinking about how I used to persecute these Christians, how I was there when they were stoned and even participated maybe in some of the stonings and killings of these Christians who have who have converted and, and seen Jesus as the Messiah. I'm sure there was some of that in Paul of, man, I used to, the, the reason they're so hurting is because I led the charge to persecute them. How I many you know that that may be true for us? And, and all these reasons, as we think about the church and we think about where it's been, there may be these moments of where you're just in, being pulled to, to give in a certain way to the church, realizing, man, I used to be the one who, who used to spit on the church. I used to be the one in the break room. Why would you give anything to that church? Why would you give to the church? Don't you know that the church is just using your money or, or they start slandering and they start persecuting it, right? And then you get saved and God changes your heart and then you start moving. There's this, there's this moment in us that, that moves us into giving. So in 2 Corinthians 8, we read about this, this narrative of what's happening that I've been explaining to you. And then 9 he doesn't, he doesn't talk, he moves from the narrative to the heart because he realized that I can give you all these scenarios of why to give, right? I can give you, here's the need, here's what's going on. Luminous Church has got another place for our youth ministry. Um, we, there, there, there's a need over here in our city that we need to take care of, that the, the gospel needs to be preached. We, we could go through all the needs, but we have to get to the heart, because God cares about the needs, but he, God is, is wealthier than all and can supply our needs with, with heavenly provision. He's caring about what's happening in your heart in this process of generosity. Let's read it, verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must Give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. 
you will be enriched, enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift that this God cares about your heart and there's a grace for giving for every person who calls himself a believer. If you say you're born again and you're a follower after Jesus, that God has given you this grace for generosity to begin to expand his kingdom and expand his mission on earth. And there's three ways that oftentimes we look at giving in the church. One, you got to give. I just feel obligated. They talk about it every Sunday. Thank goodness they don't pass the buckets like the other church. That's actually why I come here. So I don't have to have a bucket in front of me. And then I don't have cash. And then I feel bad. And then I leave worse than I came in. Right? You got to give is the first thing. The second thing is you give to get is another thought process. I'm going to give because that person, that person up there said if I give, I'm going to get. You know, if I sow, I'm going to reap. I'm going to get a blessing. Man, I'm giving right now because I just want more money in my bank account. Right? That's the second thing. That's, you know, the third thing and the thing that Paul's talking about is this grace to give that you get to give. Well, we start seeing generosity as an opportunity, but not an obligation. We see generosity as a blessing, but not a what we can get, but what we can give. We get to give. We get excited to give. In 2 Corinthians 8, 7, it says, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love, we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in the grace of giving. That this is something that we should start growing in and moving in with an excellent attitude. I want to excel. How many achievers in the room? You know, you just, you just want to achieve something. I, I'll tell you what. You know, an achiever loves to excel at giving. They're always looking for an opportunity opportunity to give. Where can I give? When can I give? How can I give? On your goal list for the New Year's, you already put a line out of forgiven. I can't wait till we give to this place. I can't wait till we give more. I can't wait, man. This year is going to be the year we start tithing. This is going to be the year that we start walking in obedience in that. This is going to be the year you start doing that. But then if you're a nine on the Enneagram, you're like, man, I, I guess I'll give. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I guess I don't know. Here we go. Maybe we're going to give. I mean, do I have money in my bank account? You know, the, I guess we'll give. You know, sevens, they're giving on their credit card. You know, they're just, they're going in debt. Man, we're going to give in faith right now, Chase. Right now, Wells Fargo. Not that, Chase. <laughs> the bank, Chase. Here we go. But 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 really, really culminates the heart of this that Paul wants to get to us today. It says this, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. Every bit of grace that you need, everything you need, where you think you have to earn, he's going to give you um, and remind you that you don't have to earn. He's going to give you that you're loved no matter what you've done. He's going to remind you that you're loved no matter what you gave. He says the, the grace is going to abound. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work, all sufficiency. That we'd be in this place of, of being content no matter the circumstance. Now, contentment's fascinating, right? Because there's this tension with contentment. Some of us think after um, we've been looking at Bohannon's, you know, steakhouse for the last um, year, for, and we're going to go there on our anniversary, that once you eat of that, of that filet, medium rare, you know, and you put that in your mouth, and it just starts melting like butter, and for some reason, all the vegans are looking at me like, you're gross. And, and, and so maybe your thing is a mushroom. I don't know what it is, but... <clears throat> And then after we eat that meal, we, what do we say? Man, I'm so content. I'm so content. Right after you, you went on vacation and you saved up for it and you went and you were anticipating it all year. And then you went on the vacation and then you were at the beach and, and then you got done. And then you're like, I'm so 
content. Right? For some of you who are single and you've just been waiting to get married and you're so excited about getting married, mainly if you're a dude and you know that you're going to have sex on your wedding night and you're just like, oh, I'm so content. <laughs> right? The thing is, we use contentment after a moment of endorphin release when we satisfy some pleasure. But that's not really what contentment is. Contentment is being content when you have and when you don't have. Content is when you're, when you're single and you're fighting for your singleness and you're struggling just to stay pure every day of your life. And you're just trying not to click something, trying not to lead somebody on um, that, that, you, that you know God has not called you to be with. But you just say, I'm going to be content in all things. This is that, that sufficiency that he gives when grace abounds to you. You see, when grace begins to abound to you, then you realize I can be sufficient in all things, even, even if my needs aren't met like I think they should be. Even if all my, my desires and my pleasure is not satisfied, I'm going to be content because I'm content in grace. Because grace is really all the sufficiency that I will ever need in my entire life. That's why Jesus said this. I count it all joy. All joy. All joy when, when the cross was presented for him. All joy, Hebrews 12, 2 says this, looking at Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. All sufficiency, all joy. The only way that I can have joy is if grace abounds in my life when suffering is presented to me. When there's this moment that's going to cause me to suffer and long for my heavenly father and cry out and bring me to a place of stress so much so that I'm sweating blood. I'm going to count it all joy because I know that God is so gracious and he's going to move in my circumstance. His grace is sufficient for me in these moments that grace may abound to us in these things. All times. And all things. Second Corinthians 8 says this. For in severe tests of affliction, there are abundance of joy and there are extreme poverty. He's referring to the Macedonians. That, that Paul put the church in Corinth who had all the excess, who had their IRAs and their same accounts and their second homes and all these things. He wanted, he just wanted, I just want to remind you there's a people that I've been playing a church with. And people are coming to the kingdom. And, and they're, they're from the land of Alexander the Great. And when the emperor came in them, he really let them have it. He took all that they had. He took everything. He, he, he just went through the village, went through the town and the land, and he began to take everything that they had ever earned, all the inheritance to their children's children. He just ripped away. But I want to tell you something that's amazing because grace has abounded in them because they received the love of Jesus, that they knew that, that no matter what they did or didn't do, that God loves them and sees them. In that moment, in that moment, they were like, we have great thankfulness in our extreme poverty. And we're going to give into a place that even if we don't have, we're going to give. We read this, how, how can they give when they don't have, right? That's like, that can't happen. But here's the thing. There's this moment where we're pinched in life. And God's telling you to give of something, and it may be your last bit. And you hear from the Holy Spirit, and it's dropped in your heart, not under compulsion, not under manipulation, but the Holy Spirit has, has, has prompted you to give. And you're like, but I don't have to give. You have that, I want it. And when you give that, it kills something inside of you. It kills this dependency on self and puts your trust totally on Jesus. Think about it. I, I'm not making this up because if we read about Luke 24, we read about the widow's might. I think it's Luke 24. Don't quote me. We read, we read about this middle, widow's might where she begins to give. 
out of out of this out of this it's her last two pennies somebody look that up and we'll we'll figure out what what chapter that is she gives her last two pennies and she doesn't have it to give but he gives it she gives it anyway and Jesus sees this in the temple courts and he brings attention to this woman and her generosity it's amazing. She went with not wanting attention, and yet Jesus highlights it. So this woman gave what she didn't have. Luke 21, thank you. This is an amazing moment, amazing moment, that God may call you to give, to kill something inside of you, that you're holding idol above him. This is what he wants for us. It's so why we've made it part of our liturgy every week to give you an opportunity to kill something that is idle in your life so that we can move into this generosity. <clears throat> Lastly, the last thing it produces is gratitude towards God. Have you been negative, bitter, frustrated? Cursing your coworker, cursing your spouse, cursing your friend. When you give, it releases a thanksgiving to God. God, I'm thankful. I'm so thankful. Every time we give, what we give in this moment that we're thankful for what he has done and for what he is doing through us. <clears throat> Would you stand with me this morning? Honestly, this should have been a sermon series because I, I, I still want to preach longer. Thankfully, you came 930 and 11 services right around the corner. But I want to position our heart and our soul and our mind around this. If you wouldn't mind closing your eyes and bowing your head, and I want to just tell you a quick story as we do. When I went to South Africa in 2009 with my wife, we had been married a year, and we took this big leap of faith that the Lord wanted us to go, and we, we raised all this money. And as we raised all this money to go to South Africa, I was like, where are the salvations? <laughs> Who's responding to the gospel? What's happening? What's going on? But we had one amazing day. You see, when we went to the Cape, and we went to Cape Point, and we went to this moment, and we, we went there. We didn't go alone, but we actually stopped by a school, the School of Hope. And it was all these underprivileged kids in the poorest, poor area of, of Cape Town, South Africa. And we rode the bus with them, and we got to know them, and they got to know us, and we laughed, and we hung out, and we had a great time. And we went down to Cape Point, and we weren't the only eyes seeing this majesty seeing this moment but all these kids most for the first time even though they only lived blocks away could never afford to go there but they saw the ma ma majestic moment as well and it's in that moment that we were able to bless over a hundred kids from the school of hope and letting their eyes see something so amazing that they got to see the love of God and how he created something so beautiful. And for a day, they were loved really well with the love of Christ. And for a day, they, they, they were brought out of their shell. And for a day, God did something amazing. And when we got back, I got to tell everybody who, who sponsored us to go. I, I said, hey, I want to know, I want you to know that God blessed Brandy and me. And we grew tremendously. But your giving and your generosity also blessed these hundred kids. And I want to tell you about their stories. And what we saw is this kingdom expansion, this kingdom multiplication. That they thought they were giving for Ben and Brandy to go experience something. But they were giving for so much more than that they were giving for these hundred kids and then three years later one of the ladies on our mission team actually moved her whole family there to live in a village to take care of HIV kids and she got that dream and that heart and that passion on that trip in that moment and now she lives there constantly changing and loving people 
that would have never been loved. I'm praying that in our churches, we have a heart for generosity, that it wouldn't just grow us, but it would expand the kingdom. It would be kingdom expansion. I'm going to pray for you real quickly. Father, we just love you. Would you just raise your hands and let's just ask God for more expansion. God, just grow our hearts. Grow our hearts right now to be a generous people, a loving people, a people who want to give, not to get, but a people who are growing as cheerful givers. Would our church be cheerfully giving, God? And I just pray that there would be a blessing from heaven that falls down on every heart in Jesus' name.